Hello, Tara. Welcome to the Well Vegan Travel Podcast. It's so exciting to have you on here at long last. Yeah, it's great to be here. I am thrilled to have you on the podcast because of what it is that you're doing in the vegan travel space and what you're going to be talking about, which is a destination that I don't think we've had a topic on before, which is Lisbon. And you are an expert in Lisbon. We'll talk more about that as well. But why don't you tell us what it is that you do in the vegan travel space? Yeah, so I'm the content creator. We have Vegan Family Adventures, and I write about our vegan family adventures all around Europe, in the United States, in South America. But uh, we're really focusing on Portugal and Europe right now as we live in Portugal. Mm, I love that. And was it difficult to start traveling not only with your family, but also as a vegan family? Yeah, so we've been traveling since the kids were babies. I was traveling before that. I, I lived in Mexico before, I lived in South America. And so I knew when we had kids that we would want to travel internationally with them and really open the world to them. So even when they were babies, like in a little baby carrier, they were traveling abroad. So we've traveled all over with them. They're they're quite adaptable. And so it's been great. And tell me a little bit more about your blog. What is the kind of things that you write about on your blog? Yeah, so I write about basically vegan guides to all these different cities worldwide. Um, and I have vegan guide to Lisbon. You know, we've been living here for two years. So I feel like I know Lisbon very intimately and I know everything that Lisbon has to offer for vegans. And um, I also write um, other places in Europe and every place that we've traveled to. And I really like to focus on traveling with families and finding vegan options wherever we go. I see, yeah. These vegan travel guides that a lot of bloggers put together, I think they're often overlooked as a resource for vegan travelers, but I think that's probably a mistake. And the reason why I say that is my knowledge of SEO and websites generally from my own business. If, if you search for like vegan travel Lisbon, for example, or vegan travel guide Lisbon, the ones that are at the top of the list ranked highly on there they're very often very frequently updated and they are very useful and the vegan community has interacted with them a lot so that really does tell you that that this article is probably very useful maybe better than some websites or maybe more up to date than happy cow in this way so it's yeah. definitely a resource that i really encourage listeners to do when they're researching destinations yeah, I agree. And one thing that we do is we write about places that we've actually been. There are some blogs out there where they're vegan or they're just travel blogs and the people haven't actually traveled there. So I feel like it's much better if you've actually been there and how to get around, where the best places are, what makes sense logistically. Mm, yeah, absolutely. These guides are amazing for that. So I'm so curious about how it is that you ended up in Portugal, in Lisbon with your family. This is not something that many people do, take their family and move to another country. What was it that made you want to do it? And what was that transition like? Yeah, so like I told you before, I lived in Mexico for two years in my 20s and I went backpacking through Central America and it ended up in Santiago, Chile for two years. I met my husband in Chile. Uh, we moved back to the United States and we were in the United States for almost 20 years and we traveled extensively with our children. Um, we were always looking for options to actually live abroad and we knew that we wanted to live in Europe. So we just did a lot of research. At first we, we thought Spain would be the best place for us since we speak Spanish. But Spain requires a lot more to be able to live there and immigrate there. So then we started looking at other options and Portugal just kept coming up high at the top of the list of um, great places for people from the United States to move to. We did a lot of research. We have some friends that are from uh, Portugal. And so we were asking them 
and they connected us with their family members and so forth. The more research that we did, uh, Lisbon looked really good. So we ended up moving in July, 2021. Our kids at the time were 13 and 15. So about to start eighth grade and 10th grade. A lot of people don't move with kids that age as well, because it's a very precarious age where they're, you know, getting into their friend groups and, um, but COVID actually helped us with that because they hadn't been seeing their friends. And so it wasn't quite as difficult or quite as dramatic for them. So we ended up moving and, um, thankfully they've embraced the culture here and, um, they're at public school, which also is not very common. Um, most of the people that come here with children, mm -hmm. they put them in um, an English-speaking international school. But we knew that wouldn't be an option for us because, you know, international schools cost about 1,500 to 2,000 euros a month. And if you have two kids, that's very unaffordable. <laughs> so uh, they're in public school. I, I tell them every day how brave they are for going to public school, even though at the beginning they didn't speak any Portuguese. Uh, they do have Portuguese classes for for foreigners, so they take that class a couple days a week, and that's helping them with the transition as well. Yeah, that's so interesting. I'm a former educator in an international school, and my job was yeah. an ESL teacher where I would support kids who, you know, their English wasn't good enough yet to completely access the curriculum or to access the curriculum at all, and it's very challenging for these kids it's also very what's the word character building I would say and I think for many of those students they come through that process of being able to speak English very well and quite well integrated and in some cases bilingual and bilingual they're just as fluent in their first language than they are in their second I mean if they can get through that, I think it's such an amazing lesson for life because once you have gone through something so difficult at an early age and been successful, what else can you get to grips with as well? It's just so cool. <laughs> exactly. It shows how resilient they are and how adaptable they are. And I just think that can only help them in the future, like when they're working or even moving to a different place and living, and it's going to help them because they have that in their background as they are able to adapt. And while we want to talk on this podcast about Lisbon as a destination, maybe there are some people listening that would love to maybe move to Europe or to take their family and live somewhere else. You mentioned how Portugal is easier for Americans to move to. Could you talk a little bit about that? And maybe if you don't mind sharing, what is it that you and your husband do? Because very often that can be challenging in terms of getting visas. For example, maybe you can be a digital nomad getting paid still in the United States, but you can't necessarily work. So would you mind sharing how that yeah. has fallen into place for you? Sure. And uh, so we are on a D7 visa. So that's the passive income retirement visa. So the D8 visa is the, the digital nomad visa. Um, the D7 is more for families, I feel, because we're immigrants here. We're going to stay. We're adapting to the culture. So we did the D7 visa, which doesn't require as much as some other visas. So for example, you have to have the minimum wage for each person, basically. So the adults are full minimum wage Portuguese, and then the children are half a minimum wage. That's the amount of money that you have to have saved, um, oh. that you have to have in your bank account to show that you can support yourself. You have to have a job or be retired and get retirement checks. Like I said, I have the vegan blog and my husband is a graphic designer, so he still does his graphic design work. And then he also has an art studio here at Elix Factory. And then with the D7 visa, it does allow us to work in Portugal if we want to, but we aren't going to work here. <laughs> wow, that's really interesting. And if I understand well, because you're paying tax, in Portugal so your kids get to go to the local schools free of charge or is that correct? Cor correct yes uh, the kids get to go to school for free 
we have free medical care, although we also have private health care, so we don't overuse their system. Um, we do have access to health care as well, and then we get our transportation passes that we pay a monthly fee for, but as residents, we get a discount. So it's pretty great. And the good thing too is that in Portugal, after you've been living here as a, a resident for five years, you can apply for citizenship. So that's one thing that deterred us from Spain because we had heard that with Spain, it takes 10 years. I see. And have you been able to learn some of the local language? I'm guessing your kids have probably got pretty good fairly quickly because they are in immersion for seven hours a day. <laughs> yes, exactly. My daughter is now in 12th grade, so she's in her very last year of high school about to go to college next year and her Portuguese is so good and her accent is so good. I'm really impressed by that. My son, he's a little bit more shy, so he's not quite at that level, but he's getting there. And then um, for me, I'm, I'm at a pretty advanced level, but still it's hard to understand because it's very different from Spanish. And Portuguese people like to cut their words, so it kind of all blends together. And so it's a little difficult to understand, but we're working on that. Amazing. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, it's just so fascinating to me that you've taken your family to Portugal and really become part of that community. And I guess you will be there for the long haul. Will your daughter go to a Portuguese university or somewhere in Europe or will she go back to the U.S.? Yeah, no, she's going to go hopefully to Paris. She wants to study animation and wow. unfortunately, Portugal doesn't offer that program at any of the universities here. So she's hoping that she gets to accept it to her dream school next year in Paris. Fantastic. So as a resident of Portugal and of course being in the EU, I imagine that she wouldn't be paying full international fees at this university in Paris. Is that fair to say? Yes, correct. They get, I think, a 5,000 euro per year discount for being an EU resident. And then, for example, her, the second school that she wants to apply to is in Denmark. And for EU students, it's actually free. Wow. Yeah, I think yeah. this is something that a lot of people don't know about is being a resident of the EU or a citizen of the EU, and I'm, I'm really impressed that just residents get these benefits as well, is that you can go and study in all of these different institutions throughout Europe. And many Europeans or European residents, they take advantage of the Erasmus program where they'll, they'll spend one year of their university in a completely different country of the EU and mm -hmm. just go and learn there even if they don't speak the local language there'll often be a an English um, program there is it's so cool the opportunities that are available to EU residents and citizens and personally that would be something that I would be considering and um, maybe this was a big factor for you as well just these incredible opportunities that you get when you're an EU resident Yes, I was going to say, hot tip actually, even if you are not an EU resident, a college is much more affordable in the EU and many of their programs are in English. Actually, most of their programs are in English because all the countries, they all speak different languages, but the language that they have in common is English. So thankfully, there's all these programs in Germany, in Denmark, in the Netherlands that are free absolutely free if like you just pay a registration fee and for your books and housing costs and your schooling is pretty much free yes yeah i didn't know about that as well but i'm sure that must be shocking to many people that are listening mm -hmm. i remember when i was teaching in an international yeah. school and some of my colleagues they were teachers and their children were students at the school as well and as a result they were very internationally minded and learned about these things and i had many colleagues who were not from the Netherlands, but they would send their kids to that particular university in the Netherlands because it had this amazing program that was so much cheaper. <laughs> yes, it's insane. In the United States, the, the cost of college is just out of this world. Yeah. It's ridiculous. And it's really sad that so many students, they 
graduate and they have tripling debt that they're paying off for 20, 30, 40 years yeah. even. Yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure. Yes, I'm sure that this has been very informative for our listeners already who are maybe thinking about doing something completely different and moving to Europe. But let's talk about the topic of this podcast, which is Lisbon, a country that you've been in for a couple of years now, and I'm sure you've explored it from top to bottom. Before we talk on specific stuff, why don't you tell us a little bit about where Lisbon is in Portugal and how you can get there? Okay, so Lisbon is pretty much in the middle of the country. Um, they don't consider it central Portugal because Lisbon is just Lisbon by itself. But if you go north, you get toward the Camino de Santiago. A lot of people know about that in Spain. So there's a little bit of Spain to the north of Portugal. And then you start going farther down and you have Porto, which is considered the north part of Portugal. And then you have other towns such as Peru. And then you go a little bit further south and it's Leiria. And that's considered central Portugal. And then, of course, you have the Alentejo region, which is the east part. But Lisbon is basically just in the middle of the country. Um, it's really easy to get to Lisbon by plane, train, bus, any mode of transportation, really. <laughs> yeah, it's a great starting spot. If you're going to Spain, you might as well add Lisbon and Portugal onto your list. What is it that makes Lisbon unique? in your eyes compared with other cities in Europe or in the Iberian Peninsula? Yeah, so one, I feel like Lisbon is a lot more affordable um, comparing to other major cities in Europe. The food, the drinks, especially the drinks, if you want to get a glass of wine or a glass of beer, it's like one euro, it's so cheap. It's much more affordable than a lot of the other European countries. For example, we went to Copenhagen this past summer and I'm like, oh my goodness, these prices, we have to get back to Lisbon. <laughs> but um, I, Lisbon just has something special about it. It's just such a beautiful city and it's cool how like you'll have these beautiful Baroque or Mandolin style buildings and they're really interesting. And then next to it, you'll have a dilapidated building. So it's kind of interesting to see that like the richness yet there's also that aspect of being a little bit dilapidated. Mm. And it's really interesting too, just to walk all over the city and go to all the viewpoints and see how the city looks from high above. I think there's like 10 viewpoints in the city of Lisbon. So it's just, it's such a beautiful city. I just every time exploring and walking around, it's like, I'm so happy. I'm so fortunate to be living here. Yes. Yeah, I've never been to Lisbon. I've been to Porto and I did a vegan river cruise on the Douro River and I saw the that thing that you're talking about. It is like a little bit gritty. It's, it's not super wealthy compared with other European countries and you'll see that dilapidation from time to time or villages and towns that they seem a little bit sad in some ways. <laughs> But on the other side of that is that, you know, it's got plenty of character and, and great population and it, it's cheaper. <laughs> you get a yes. lot for your money. And the people are very friendly here. They're very accommodating and they make you feel welcome. And it's nice too when they see like you're struggling maybe to speak the language, they'll try to help you. <laughs> They speak English so well here. So I think that's another reason why it's a little hard to learn the language quickly right. because as soon as they hear your accent, they, if they speak English, they just start speaking English to you. Right. Yeah, that, that often happens, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yes. And there's something as well I think that's interesting about Portugal is that it's quite progressive in many ways. One of the things that really surprised me I learned about some time ago is that all drugs have been decriminalized. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. That is correct. Um, basically, if somebody is caught with drugs or doing drugs, they're pretty much sent to rehab. So instead of going to jail, they'll find some interventions for them. So they'll go to rehab or go to mental health services. Um, people that are like living on the street, it's pretty much by choice because they have places for people to go. So that's really good. It's they say that it's helped a lot with crime and with just the whole jail 
situation. And then most of the people that are on the street, if they're selling drugs, it's not actually true drugs. A lot of people, they say they sell hashish, but it's actually like laurel leaves. Oh, is what I heard. <laughs> I mean, they can't get caught because if the police go to them and they say, okay, what are you selling? And it's laurel leaves. Right. Yeah. Wow. Super interesting. And you mentioned how Lisbon is built on a hill. I think I'm recalling pictures of these incredible trams that go throughout the city uphill. Yes. Yes. So Lisbon is known as the city of seven hills and um, they have a few trams that go up the hills, basically in the Fama district and the areas that are very hilly. So it's very interesting because you'll be walking on the sidewalk and all of a sudden this tram will come and you'll have like a very small amount of space. Like basically you have to be like right up against the building so you don't get hit by the tram. But I don't take the tram very often. It's kind of like a tourist uh, thing to do. Oh, really? If I take it, it's usually like late at night when nobody's on it or I typically just do what the locals do. I'll just walk everywhere, take the metro or, or a bus. Oh, wow. They have a metro even in such a hilly place. Yes, yes we have everything. There's buses, metro, trams, um, what do they call electricos, and then they have the ferry, they have trains. It's insane, like the amount of public transportation they have here, is, it's so great. Is it pretty easy to navigate to even as a visitor? Oh yeah, yeah, I always recommend people get the City Mapper app and that's the best to get around to know what time the transportation is coming. Fantastic. What are the things that you can actually do in Lisbon that would be interesting to a vegan traveler? Now, of course, we'll talk about your favorite restaurants towards the end and how people can experience the vegan food. But aside from that, what are some great things to do? My favorite is to go check out all the viewpoints. So whenever I, I have friends visiting, I always take them to the viewpoints. Of course, I take them to LX Factory. Alex Factory was an old warehouse that they have converted into a district of um, restaurants, hostels, boutique stores, art studios. My husband has an art studio there um, and it's just such a fun, interesting place to be. They have live music, they have a weekend market, outdoor pop-up market, and there's cool murals and just really cool art to see. So I always like recommend people go there. And then of course the main areas, Praça do Comercio and Chiavo, that's the main touristy area. Then a lot of people like to go to Alfama. That's actually the most diverse neighborhood in Lisbon. I think they said they have 90 nationalities that live in that little area. And that's uh, probably the hilliest area of Lisbon. Uh, you have to go there, like usually first thing in the morning when, when you're nice and rested and ready to walk up all the hills. So that's a very popular area. A lot of people like to go to the castle at the top. It has such a spectacular view of the city and the river and the bridge. So you get to see everything. But my favorite viewpoint is actually Eduardo Park. Um, it's a little bit north of the city. And um, I don't know if you've seen pictures of like greenery where it stretches down towards the river and it's really cool. It just looks like a bunch of green cubes, but it's grass oh. or plants. Yeah, it's really cool. So I just like to walk around the city all the time. They have this thing in Lisbon called drink kiosks. So every little area will have these little kiosks that are converted into the drinks and snack places to just sit down and have a quick drink. It doesn't have to be quick. And a lot of times they're overlooking nice viewpoints. And um, so that's one of my favorite things to do. You can get very affordable uh, little cups of beer or <laughs> wine for one euro. Water is actually more expensive than the beer and wine. <laughs> is aperitivo or whatever the Portuguese equivalent a big thing in Lisbon? Is that something that Portuguese people love to do? Yeah, yeah. They love to have little snacks and drinks before they actually have their meal. So a lot of times when they get off of work, that's what they'll do. They'll meet up with friends or they'll stop and hang out at a kiosk for a little bit before they go home or before they go out to, to get something to eat. I absolutely love the ritual of aperitivo. It is amazing. And it's these drink kiosks, they seem 
different and interesting, really cool. Yeah, they're so much fun. Tell me, are there interesting museums that people might like to check out in the city? Yeah, so I actually have a blog post about that. I would say for my family, our favorite is the Coach Museum. So it's like these carriages from a long time ago, and they're just really ornate and spectacular. So that's really cool. And one thing that's really awesome is that if you are a Portuguese resident, you get to go see these museums for free on Sundays. It's free all throughout the city. So that's a really nice benefit and helps people that live here. And then another one that's really popular is called the MAT. I think it's the Museum of Architecture and Technology. And it's uh, housed in the former ele electric station. And that's actually really cool to see. And they have a beautiful view. It's right on the river. And so it's really nice to walk along the river and then stop at that museum. Are there any activities that are really interesting to vegans? I'm thinking, for example, bike tours or like guided tours of certain areas or anything like that. I'm just thinking of like some activities that listeners of the po this podcast who are going to Lisbon might like to check out. Yeah, so they do have um, a lot of bike tours all over the city. It's usually with electric bikes because there are so many hills. A lot of people don't want to be biking up the hills. And then um, something that's very popular are the tuk-tuk tours. So mm -hmm. people love those. They go crazy for them. So a lot of people will do the tuk-tuk tours all over the city. And it's a good way of seeing a lot and not having to walk everywhere. So if you have mobility issues, um, that might be a good option for you. And then I always kind of recommend when anybody goes to any like city and there's a lot to see, it's good to get a ticket for those hop on hop off buses because especially on your very first day, because if you go on one your very first day, you really get oriented on how the city is laid out and what areas you want to return to on your own. So I think that's a really good thing to do as well, but they have lots of great fun activities to do. Mm. Yeah, that's a really great recommendation. I also encourage people to jump on some sort of guided walking tour as well, or in place of what you suggested. Definitely what you suggested is going to give a bigger overview, but a walking tour, a guided walking tour is fantastic too. And I'd be curious, maybe you don't know, but whether Lisbon has this as well, but they have a lot of these free walking tours now. And you just pay a tip at the end to the guide. And I've had amazing walking tours that way. And through that, you could also ask a lot of questions and get recommendations of the guide. It's, it's super cool. Is that available in Lisbon too? Yes, yes. There are all sorts of walking tours. There's the historical one. My personal favorite is the tours that they take you to see the street art because I love street art. So I'm always looking for that kind of activity for people to show me maybe the street art that you can't just see on the main streets. You have to go into the little hidden enclaves or little alleyways that you don't really see unless you know somebody that knows that area. Oh my goodness, that sounds awesome. And I'm curious, obviously Lisbon is quite a large city, but are there some interesting things to do on the outskirts or things that would make a good day trip from Lisbon? Oh my gosh, there's so many good places to go. I was like, where do I begin? There's so many awesome places around. You have endless opportunities if you come here. Um, there's of course, you know, little areas that are basically in Lisbon, but not so close to the center that are really interesting to see. For example, the neighborhood of Avalad is really, really cute. It reminds me of the West Village of New York City. And then um, there's an area called Campo Grande, and that's actually one of my favorite parks to walk down. And that's actually my favorite drink kiosk because every Friday they have live music there. They either have live music, people playing instruments and singing, or they have a DJ. So you get all of that for your price of your one euro beer. <laughs> Incredible. It's pretty amazing, yes. Um, so there's some really cool places to go very close to the beach. Like there are so many beaches that are so close. Kishkaish and Estoril are the most common ones because you can take the train from the center by the Thai Mount Market. You take the train all the way to Kishkaish. 
a lot. And Peshkaish is an adorable city. It's really cute. That's actually where, I don't know if you know the soccer star Ronaldo. He's having a huge mansion built there. So it's a hot place to be. A lot of people love Peshkaish. And then if you cross the bridge, you can go to the beaches of Costa de Caparica. And I love Costa de Caparica because it's not as fancy as Peshkaish. And there are three fully vegan restaurants there. Because well, Costa de Caparica is small, it's a very small town, but yet they have three delicious all vegan restaurants. Incredible. Wow. So let's talk about the food a little bit in Portugal and Lisbon, of course. I'm sure, like Spain and France, there's some specialties that definitely are not vegan. So I'm curious to know about how our listeners who go to Lisbon might be able to sample the traditional Portuguese food made vegan. Can you recommend some places and some dishes? Yeah, so there are actually, I think, three or four uh, restaurants in Lisbon that specialize in veganized Portuguese food. So Portuguese food in itself, I I've heard that it's not super tasty. Mm -hmm. uh, because they don't really like spicy food very much here. So it's not full of like a lot of flavor. But the veganized versions of those dishes that I've tried have been really good and flavorful. Um, so there's a restaurant called Kong and they're known for their veganized Portuguese food, the bacalhau, which is like a fish. And they actually have an octopus salad, but it's not octopus. I think they use some sort of mushroom to mimic mm. that flavor and texture. And then um, they have a dish called the Francesinha, and it's actually like a sandwich with tomato sauce. Ah, so, okay. It's not my favorite, but my son likes it. <laughs> but I don't like soggy bread, so <laughs> it's not my favorite. I think I'm familiar. Can you tell me the name of that sandwich again? Francesinha. Okay. Yeah. I think I've heard about it. Yeah. It's definitely okay. a Portuguese specialty. And I think I might've tried it when I was in Porto perhaps. <laughs> yeah. I think it's one of those things you either love it or you don't. And I'm on the don't side, but my husband and son adore it. So I think I love it. If I like poutine, which is French fries with a vegan cheese curds or cheese with tons of brown sauce or gravy on it, that I think I would love this. <laughs> I think you would. <laughs> and then of course they're famous for their dessert, the pastel de nata. So that's like a custardy little pie type thing. And they have a fully vegan one called vegan nata. And that's in the touristy area. So perfect. You can get them. You won't feel like you're being left out of having this delicious dessert because you can just go to vegan nata. So how is the vegan scene in Lisbon? Are there a few vegan restaurants? There are more than a few. There are so many and they're opening new ones like every other week. I have to add them to my list of my vegan guide to Lisbon. The vegan scene is really great here. It's improving every day. Um, thankfully we're getting newer people that are making more like creative dishes. So we're really spoiled here. And then of course, there's a lot of foreigners moving here. A lot of people from other European countries and they're bringing their flavors here. So one of my favorite restaurants is actually owned by a Lithuanian. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so they have delicious foods, like the flavors of their country. Um, another really popular restaurant, El San Pietrino, they're from Italy. So it's vegan Italian food. Wow. So. That just sounds so, so delicious. And I love this idea of, you know, having Portuguese food, but also being able to try all of these other foods as well. Because if I understand well, Port Portugal and Lisbon, of course, there are a lot of EU members coming to live there because mobility is so easy. But it's also got a lot of um, people from other places as well. Like I'm guessing there's going to be quite a few North Africans or Africans living there and lots of amazing food options too. Is that fair to say? Yeah. And there's actually some Syrian restaurants and I'm trying to think Damascus. There's food from everywhere. Unfortunately, there is, I have not found any Ethiopian restaurants yet. And oh. that makes me so sad because that was one of my favorite foods to eat when we were in the United States. 
So I keep hoping some Ethiopians will come here and, and open up a restaurant. Yes, Ethiopian food is just so vegan friendly and just so darned delicious. And it's definitely a really great thing to search for in a big city when there aren't many vegan options because it's so good. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So I am sure people listening to this podcast are going to want to head to Lisbon and take advantage of all of the recommendations that you've made, maybe even to move there for a longer period of time. Are there any particular tips that you have that will help make travel easier, whether it's vegan or not vegan? Yeah, and thankfully, Oh, pretty much everybody knows what vegan is these oh. days here. And the good thing is you can go to any restaurant and you will find at least one or two vegan options. I mean, even my kids at school, every, on the daily menu, they have one vegan option every single day. What? Yes. That's incredible. Yes, it's incredible. And it's not just like salad. It's actually like seitan and tofu and like all these amazing dishes for about one euro fifty a day. Thankfully, Portugal has uh, made this a priority. And so anywhere you go, you can find great vegan food. But of course, I prefer to support the vegan businesses. So I tend to only go to vegan restaurants because that's where they say, uh, vote with your dollars, vote with your euro. So I would rather uh, pay and keep uh, the vegan businesses afloat. So, and another great thing is in Lisbon, they actually have two or three all vegan grocery stores where you don't even have to look at the labels. They've already done the work for you. Everything is vegan. And it's so amazing. And my favorite is called Green Beans and it's in the Chiavu neighborhood, which is actually the very touristy area. So if you come to Lisbon and you stay in the touristy area, you're walking distance to this amazing vegan shop. And they even have a cafe that they just opened. So that's pretty awesome. And then also in the city, there's a couple of stores um, that make vegan shoes and they're actually like eco-friendly, sustainable. A lot of the shoes are either made on cork or they use um, the pina text from the pineapple or they have the mushroom based shoe as well. So it's pretty amazing that they have all these great options these days. So one of the stores is in Elix Factory and the other store is in Chialo, again, in the very touristy area. So if you come to Lisbon, you're really walking distance to pretty much all the hot spots. I really like that. And something that listeners might not know about Europe and the EU is because of the way European Union does trade, it's very easy to import and export products to other EU countries. So I've never been to this shop and I'm going to make a prediction and you can tell me whether I'm right or not. I think that okay. probably in this little Portuguese shop, they probably have a huge selection of vegan cheeses from all over Europe. Is that fair to say? Yes, yes definitely. There are some made in Portugal. A lot of the products are made in Portugal, but of course there's things that come from Italy, from Greece from France. So yes, it's from all over. Yeah. Yeah. Just incidentally, the podcast, my podcast, that guest that I was talking to you just before I got on the phone on the call with you, Tara, was Jason and he owns Vegan Supply in Vancouver, where I live, which is a vegan grocery store. And we talked about how challenging it is to import products from around the world because of these very strict rule that in this case Canada has about getting stuff in and of course the expensive shipping and the labeling that needs to be done and all of that but in the EU most of this stuff is just non-existent so it's so cool and definitely I recommend people go and check out these incredible vegan grocery stores and take some products home it's also really great for picnicking and stocking up on yes. items for if you're going to the countryside and going to be self-catering we do it all the time <laughs> Yes, I agree. And that my husband will tell you, that's one of my favorite activities. When I go anywhere, I like to go to the grocery stores and check out what they have. Um, it's amazing what Lidl has. And I don't know if you're familiar with Lidl and Aldi. They always have, it's like Trader Joe's, but 
in the EU. Well, they're all over, but Lidl has a great selection of vegan items. And they even have like special vegan weeks where they bring more stuff on, which I wish they would just have all the time. Yeah, it's so cool. And just how Europe is really jumping on the vegan trend, even regular supermarkets in the French countryside will have quite a few great options in terms of vegan meats, vegan cheeses, yogurts, which just makes self-catering a breeze, even if there are not a lot of vegan restaurants around. It's so cool. Exactly. I love that. Do you have any other tips to share? So like I said earlier, if you come to the city, use, if you're going to use public transportation, definitely get the city mapper app. And then if you don't want to use public transportation and you want to use a car, you could use Bolt. Um, that's my favorite app for getting around if I'm not using public transportation. So there's Bolt or Uber. They're much cheaper than the taxis. I think they said that the drivers actually get paid like a pretty fair amount. So that's a good trick. My favorite is just to walk around the city because that you really get the vibe of the city that way. And Lisbon has a very special vibe. And I think that anybody that comes here falls in love with the city. Yes, I think you're right there. I was just on social media looking at some of our former travelers. They traveled with us a couple of times, two sets of travelers actually, and they just finished their trip to Portugal and absolutely loved it. I think there is a reason why Portugal is really hot right now, both in terms of just visiting as a tourist, but also doing what you did and taking opportunity of the ease in which most people can emigrate there and just um, enjoying life and just having access to Europe and all of the wonderful benefits that it has. Exactly. I think the secret has gotten out. Uh, Portugal is definitely a hot spot now. You see it in magazines and in articles all the time about being a great place to retire. I think if you're going to move here, you should do it soon <laughs> before everybody moves here. Yes, and that they change the rules, maybe. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I did see something online that maybe they were considering that. I can't remember any details, but uh, yeah, I, I, we can't always necessarily expect these incredible visas to be available to everyone forever. Tara, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the podcast. I really appreciate it. Before we go, would you mind sharing all your website again and your social media handles so people can go follow and check out your blog as a really great tip for vegan travelers? Of course. So my blog is veganfamilyadventures.com. You can find me on Pinterest, also Vegan Family Adventures. And then on Instagram and Facebook, it's veganfamily.adventures. Got it. So definitely follow me. Um, I love posting about everywhere that we travel and I love posting about food. So you always find some food pictures as well. I love it. Thank you so much, Tara. Thank you for having me.